Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are going to be looking at how to design clamps or snubbers in switching converters that use transformers. This is a very important topic in isolated DC-DC converters because these circuits are used to reduce overshoot associated with parasitics in these converters. So we're gonna show you on the board how to design these circuits and specifically what we're gonna look at is an RCD or resistor capacitor diode snubber. Let's jump in and get started. Today we're going to be talking about RCD snubbers, also known as RCD clamp circuits. So the R, C, and D are resistor, capacitor, and diode, respectively. Now if you take a look at our flyback converter module project, you will see on that primary side of the transformer an RCD snubber circuit. So that circuit uses a resistor and a capacitor in parallel. And then these are connected together with a diode. And then this is connected back up to the line voltage here up at the top. Now, if you look at a typical DC-DC converter, what you will see is the top of this is connected to one of the ends of the transformer coil. And then here we have a connection over to the diode. And then down here, we have our connection to our FET. Here we have our gate and this is our PWM waveform coming in, and then this basically just goes to ground. Now, this can also be used in a push-pull converter, and in a push-pull converter, you're using a center-tapped transformer that basically puts a duplicate of this circuit in parallel, and when this duplicate circuit is put in parallel, you then have a second FET, which is also driven with a PWM waveform, and so those two waveforms push power through each of the two coils, and then that couples to the secondary side where it's rectified, and then that gives you a DC output. Most commonly used in flyback converters. However, you can use the same identical one in a push-pull converter. And the design process that I'm gonna show here for this is the same, whether you're using push-pull or whether you're using flyback. Now, in order to design this circuit, we first have to know what it's doing. So as I mentioned before, its purpose is to essentially clamp any overshoot due to parasitics within this system. Where do the parasitics come from? Well, there are two really important parasitics that can lead to a lot of ringing in this circuit. The first parasitic is right here on the transformer. This parasitic inductance is called the leakage inductance. So we can call it L with a little lowercase l subscript. Then there is also a capacitance across this uh, FET. Now this FET capacitance is the output capacitance, and the symbol that's usually used to represent it is COSS. Now COSS is made up of two other capacitances that are native to this FET. The first one is the drain source capacitance, which basically exists across these two terminals, and then you have the gate drain capacitance. CGD. These two individual capacitances are not normally specified inside of a data sheet. What you'll actually just see is a value for COSS. Sometimes you might see CDS and then you might wonder, well, how do I get COSS if I don't know CGD? Well, there's another capacitance that's often identified in data sheets, which is called CRSS, or the reverse transfer capacitance, and that is equal to CGD. If you have one of these, you can figure out the other one and vice versa. Now, for most FETs, this drain source capacitance is going to be much larger than the gate drain capacitance. So COSS is simply approximated as the drain source capacitance in some cases. So now let's take a look at some of the waveforms in this circuit and then we can see exactly how we have to design this snubber uh, circuit. So during operation, when the pulse wave modulated signal turns on this FET, essentially what you have is a rising current in this transformer. And eventually that current rises until it reaches some peak current, we'll call that IP. And then suddenly, the drain turns off. That's because these pulse wave modulated waveforms can be very quick. And so you have a very fast turn off. During that instance when this turns off, the peak current starts to decrease very quickly and eventually reaches zero. Now during that turn off phase, what happens in the transformer? 
Because the signal in the transformer is very rapidly dropping to zero, the leakage inductance releases all of its energy. And then that creates a large current loop that passes through this inductance and passes over this capacitance. So what happens when you have a transient event creating a voltage drop across this inductance and this capacitance? You can get very strong ringing in this circuit because you basically have no damping in this circuit. So during this event, some current can then pass into this leg of the circuit. We'll just call that I snubber here. And this forward bias is this diode. So this power that is stored in this leakage inductance is being released, and then it needs to be dissipated across this snubber circuit. So how much power is that? Well, the power associated with the leakage is just given by this value. Here we have our L leakage, here we have our current squared, and then we have our frequency. So this F sub S is our switching frequency, and as you can see here, of course, on average, if we're switching faster, we're gonna be delivering more power to this snubber circuit, and the snubber circuit needs to be designed so that it can withstand this amount of power released from the leakage inductance. Now, what is the role of these two circuit elements in this snubber circuit? Well, first, you'll note here that we have a capacitor. So the role of this capacitor is to essentially just charge up and hold as stable of a voltage as possible during these events. So that means if we measure the voltage across this capacitor, essentially it's going to look something like this, where during the transient event, it rises up and eventually reach some value. And there's going to be some ripple associated with this switching action superimposed on top of this capacitor. But in stable operation, it will look something like this. You basically have an average rising waveform and then you have the switching waveform associated with the PWM signal that is then superimposed on top of this. Now, the size of this ripple is going to depend on the size of R and C. So we're gonna take that into account when we size these two values for this snubber circuit. So how do we size R sub S and C sub S? Well, we need to size these such that we're taking account of this ripple across this capacitance. So that ripple is going to be some delta V. And we're gonna use that in sizing the capacitor here. Now, what's the role of R? Well, R's job is to dissipate this much power across it. So we're gonna use P sub L in order to size R. Now, R sub S is given by this very interesting looking equation. So here we have VSN, which is basically the voltage drop across this primary coil, squared divided by P sub L. And it's gonna be multiplied by this other factor here. Now, this other factor is given by, again, the snubber voltage divided by the snubber voltage minus, now we need a term here. This other term is N multiplied by the output voltage. Remember over here on this secondary side, we have another coil. This coil on the secondary side has some turns ratio with respect to the primary side. So here we're assuming an N to one transformer. And then here we have a coil on this secondary side and this outputs some voltage V sub zero. Typically in this type of converter, you'll actually have a diode here and this diode is for rectification. Here we're just ignoring the diode voltage drop for the moment. Of course, you can add that back in. You can also make the assumption that the output voltage on the secondary side is going to be much larger than the diode voltage drop. So the actual V out is very close to the V out on the secondary coil. Those are all appropriate approximations. Either way, you will get back to this equation for R sub S. We have some output voltage that we're trying to reach on the secondary coil. And then this is our value for our snubber voltage that we wanna be able to withstand between these two points from the line down here to this node connected to the FET. Next, we have the capacitor. So our snubber capacitor is just given by the snubber voltage divided by our delta V. And this is multiplied by the snubber resistor and the switching frequency. This basically tells you everything that you need to know about this snubber circuit. So what's one of the keys to designing this correctly? Well, you have to know how much ripple you can withstand and then what that snubber voltage is going to be. So the voltage across these two points 
that you can withstand with this diode and then with this FET. So as long as you know those values, you can plug them in here and then you can figure out everything that you need to calculate RS and CS. Now there's one other thing that you need in order to do this correctly. You need to know what's your peak current limitation. So the peak current limitation, if you just go back to our flyback converter module, we actually selected the peak current limitation based on the capabilities of our switcher because our switcher had this FET integrated into it, right? It had a drain pin on the switcher and that's where all the current goes. So we actually got to pick this. Switching frequency, of course, we also get to pick that. It's based on the characteristics of your switcher. What about the leakage inductance? The leakage inductance needs to be measured. You can usually estimate it based on the coil inductance here. So what's an appropriate estimate for the leakage inductance? Well, it really depends on the structure of your transformer. If you don't know how to estimate it, a good approach is to overestimate the leakage inductance that you have on your transformer. Now, in everything I was saying earlier, I brought up the leakage inductance several times. So how do we figure out what the leakage inductance is? Well, thankfully, it's really simple to measure the leakage inductance. Here, I'm measuring the self-inductance of the primary coil. To get the leakage inductance of the primary coil, I just short the secondary coil. So to do that, I'm just gonna hook a little clip across all the terminals on the secondary side, and we can already see here what our leakage inductance is. So it's a pretty low value. So that's 15 microhenries approximately compared to our about 935 microhenries. That's actually less than 10%. That's pretty good for a professionally wound transformer. Now, it's much larger than the estimates that you will see in some reference designs. For some reference designs, they would take a thousandth of the self-inductance as the leakage inductance and use that to then calculate all of the parameters and components needed for the reference design. Well, clearly, the leakage inductance value that you should use is much higher than the value that you might find in some reference designs. So you can see here what it is in our design. It's only about one or 2%. So we can use that value to then figure out exactly what uh, values for the components we need in our RCD snubber. Now, if we just rearrange this equation for the resistance momentarily, we basically get something that looks like this. We have P sub L in the denominator, and then if we just rewrite this, we get the snubber voltage multiplied by the snubber voltage minus our output voltage multiplied by our turns ratio. What do we notice about this equation? Well, we notice that we're going to get larger values for the snubber voltage if our resistor is larger. That should make sense, right? We're flowing some current into this snubber and of course, when this diode is forward biased, all of that current is going to get dropped across this resistor once this capacitor charges up. So then we would expect, of course, that voltage across the snubber to basically get larger as RS gets larger. What else does RS do? Well, RS, as we would expect for an RC circuit, slows down the time for this capacitor to charge and discharge. So what is it gonna do? It's gonna reduce that ripple. So if we just solve for delta V in this bottom equation, we have C sub S down here, and then we would have delta V right here. You can see when RS goes up, delta V goes down. So this should illustrate the noise control characteristics of this snubber resistor. What's another way that we can control the noise without having to, let's say, use a very large resistor? Well, the other lever that we can pull is our switching frequency. As the switching frequency goes up, we see that delta V would go down because, of course, this is in the denominator. What's the problem with having a fast switching frequency? Well, as the switching frequency goes up, the edge rate for this turn on and turn off time also has to go down in order for the switching frequency to accommodate fast edges. That can create a problem with this diode because this diode needs to have very fast reverse recovery time. Eventually, if those edges on that switching waveform get faster than the diode's reverse recovery time, you will start to dissipate a lot of heat in this diode, and that's bad. You will need to swap out that diode for a much faster diode. Typically, you'll wanna use a Schottky rectifier diode, something that has something on the order of nanoseconds reverse recovery time.
Thanks for watching this video, everybody. If you want to learn more about our flyback converter module project, take a look at the link in the description. We're gonna be manufacturing that board soon. We'll be doing some testing on it and we're gonna ensure that our snubber design actually works correctly. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave a comment in the comment section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah. <laughs>